Venga, Luigi. Then the literature is really vast, and I'm going to just uh, mention a few, a few things that I found useful uh, for better understanding. So there's Richard Sabo has a book. Uh, the book is called Equivarian Cohomology and Localization of Path Integrals. And this is uh, from 2000, uh, Springer, okay? Then um, Raoul Bott, so one of the inventors himself, has a, some, a lecture that is called an introduction to equivalent cohomology. And this is actually Son Lesouche lecture from 99. And it's quite nice because, of course, uh, it's, it's addressed to physicists. So it is very rigorous, but it has uh, everything in, in a language that we like, the language of differential forms. Um, and the last um, note that you can look online is Matvey uh, Libin. And this is um, 07, 09, This is really written uh, for, for a math audi audience. But then he has, as a mathematician, he has the oracle. He has the full truth, and it, uh, it's, it's also fun to, to read. Okay? So this is what I'm going to, to be talking about in the next hour. Um, so first, let, let me tell you the class of problems that we want to discuss. Okay? Um, so I guess I, I, I did not say anything about the, the, the beauties of supersymmetry localization, you're already here, that proves that you're interested. So I don't have to motivate it a lot. Uh, but what I'm going to discuss is a simpler, a simpler setup where things can be done very, very rigorously, finite dimensional setup. Okay, so, so this is, let me now spend a few minutes talking about the setup. So I'm interested, so let me take some manifold M, maybe with a metric. So I'm going to, of course, at the end I will, I will tell you how to relax a number of conditions, but I'm going to start assuming everything that I need. So I have some, some manifold M. I'm going to call it 2N dimensional. Okay, um, so I, I'm going to also put some local coordinates X, and I'm going to consider some function F. And the kind of inter intervals that we're interested, I'm going to write, so they depend on some parameter T. And they are going to be integrals over this manifold of dx square root of g. And then I have something like this. Oops, t f of x. OK? So this is the kind of integrals that we all know and love. You, you think that this is some simpler version, some finite dimensional version of a path integral. Um, so what we usually, what we usually understand, at, even at, at the level of quantum mechanics, is, um, is the following statement. In, the t goes to infinity limit, okay? So the phase changes very rapidly, so you have some sort of interference, okay? I'm just reminding you of things from quantum mechanics. And in that case, um, what you're really uh, concerned about, or, or the, main, the main contribution come from the stationary, stationary points of, of this function f. So in fact, one of the main formulas that we like to write, I'm going to write approximate so that I don't have to worry about two pi's, and, and, but I will do the two pi's later. But right now, I just want to make sure that we roughly assume or, or realize that in this case, so as xk are the fixed points, so points such that this differential is zero. And essentially, what we are going to have is on sum and here I'm going to write something like this, very, very determinant of, of Haitian. So I'm going to write it like this. So that's the kind of formula that we, that we have in, uh, that, that I'm interested. So this, is this, type of ob this type of integral is going to be my, my object. Of course, uh, in the context of quantum mechanics, this T is related to 1 over H bar, and this F is related to the action. Right, so now we, we know what we want to understand. I want to understand these kind of integrals. I want to understand exactly when such an approximation, so this actually will have correction t to the, let me write the corrections, minus l minus one. Uh, l is, of, again, the dimension of the manifold. So I'm interested, my question, I, now I can formulate it a little bit more precise. 
My question is, so here's my main question, is this when are such integrals exact? And I will, of course, I have to de define what exact means, but this is my question. So I want to understand the mathematical machinery that will guarantee for me that when I compute something using the fixed points, that would be it. That is my full answer, and there are no other corrections. That's, that's, the, that's the context. Um, so now let me do, there's one example in this, that if I had an extra blackboard, which I done, I would just write it and leave it there, because this is the example that would be recurrent in, in this whole lecture. So let me, let me, let me give you, <clears throat> again, I'm still in the formulation of the problem, okay? I, I want to very clearly uh, state for you what is it that I want to solve. So my example oops, is the following. So we want to consider the round as two with metric, canonical metric, d theta square, plus sine square of theta, d phi square. Okay, and I'm going to consider my function f. Uh, in principle, it can be a function of all the coordinates, but I'm going to take it to be cosine of, of theta. Okay, and you will see that this is a this is a, a, a miraculous choice. And then I will, at the end of the lecture, you will see why this is a particular important choice. So in that case, my integral. I can write it here. My integral can be written zero to pi d phi. 0 to pi uh, d theta, the square root of the, of the determinant of the metric is sine of theta, and then I have i t cosine of theta. Okay, because I don't have a very big blackboard, this design I'm going to write as d cosine minus sine here, and now you see that this is a very simple integral, dx e to the something x, and I evaluate this and my answer um, is going to be two pi, two pi comes from here, i divided by t, and then I have minus e to the i t plus e to the minus i t. So this is the answer, and of course for pi, sine of t divided by t. So this example, of course, is the, the, the canonical example that I want to develop, but because I'm still in the business of defining my question very, very carefully, um, I'm going to restate the question again. So, so let, me put, let me make a couple of remarks. Um, so the integral is a sum of, of, of terms that correspond to the stationary points of this function, derivative of cosine is sine on zero and pi, and um, if the sum of two terms, and these two terms come from fixed points, fixed points of the circle action. So I haven't said it, let me, let me say it. The circle action, of course, I'm talking about is two. Uh, let me draw it like here. And I'm considering the action which is phi goes to phi plus one constant. And of course it has two fixed points. These are the points that essentially give me these two terms, okay? So in this sense, you can say, this is a very baby, uh, it's a baby case of, a, of the baby case of finite dimensional. But in this case, you can see that the integral localizes and it gets contribution only from the stationary points of, of, the, of, of the action, which in this case is just translation by phi. So that is more general, okay, so that's essentially what allows me to, oops. Sorry? Yes, in this case it's the Hessian, right. Evaluated, I mean there's two points, minus one and one, and I evaluated at the two points, thanks. Okay, so what is the problem with this kind of integral? So let, let me now say again. The question again is, is computing, or if you wish, understanding integrals over m 
with some symmetry, some symmetry group G. So that's really what, what, I'm, what I'm interested, right? So that's the kind of, uh, the kind of problem that I have. But now, the, the naive, or the, the, the first impulse that you might have is, is the, the one thing that comes from physicists and uh, from, from gauge transformation, et cetera. So you, you think, well, one, one possibility is, of course, to identify all points that are connected by, by a transformation, right? That would be a natural thing for you to, to do, to say, well, I'm interested in manifolds with some symmetry. Let me question by the symmetry. And then uh, that's what you do, let's say, in, um, in electrodynamics, et cetera. But, but you see the problem with that quotient. So this is S2. If I divide by S1, uh, the space that I get, so now I, I, I wake up the students. What is the space that I get when I do that quotient? An interval, right? So I get something like this, OK? And from your kid, they got the cohomology. You know that the cohomology of something that is contractible, in this case, this point, is empty. So cohomology is, is, a, is the, the precise way to talk about integrals. So all the integrals that I would like to compute, if I assume that what I need to do is just to quotient the space, are going to be trivial. I would not have anything interesting like what I have here. So that tells me that, that the naive, the most natural thing to do is going to lead us to, to, a, to a problem. And of course, the problem comes from fixed points. If I didn't have any fixed points here, then of course, this will work. But in the presence of fixed points, uh, my construction doesn't work. My construction essentially doesn't give me uh, what, what I'm interested in. Okay. So now uh, that, that set up set the stage to define equivalent cohomology. That's what I want to talk about now. So I have to now tell you what is the construction that will take care of integrals over spaces with the action of a group, but that doesn't go this route because this route is, is dead end for us. Okay. Okay, so again, I'm in, in my same, same category, so two L-dimensional manifolds, maybe with even with a metric. And now let, let's, consider, let's consider this group G to be a billion. Okay, let's do the simpler, the simpler case. Um, so in this case, of course, what I mean is that I have some vector. I'm going to write it like this in some appropriate coordinates. And this vector has to be a killing vector of the metric. And this is essentially what, what you saw here. Okay, this is, again, this example is really very, very nice. Um, so again, the killing derivative of the metric, which is d mu v mu plus d mu. This is zero. Okay. <coughs> Good. So this is the lead derivative. So now I will introduce a little bit of notation. Again, my goal now is here. I want to define equivalent cohomology. So I need, uh, as I said, I need to introduce a, a, a number of, of, of objects. So definition. Um, so let, let me define. I, this is the, the notation of, of Cremonesi, but um, sometimes people write like this, so omega of m, this is going to be the space, by definition, the space of forms, polyforms indeed, so from n0 to 2L, of forms of the, oops, differ, differential forms of degree n, uh, so basically this space, so alpha n is again lambda n of m. Okay, so what I do is instead of considering some particular form, I'm going to some this is the formal sum of all, of all forms of degree from zero to, 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 to 12. Uh, okay, so it's not very easy, no? Because uh, maybe I can, I, can, I can project it like this. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so, so first definition is uh, the space of polyforms. It's some sum of, of forms from zero, uh, differential form of degree zero to 12. Uh, the other definition is the V equivariant differential. Uh, 
Okay, so the D equivalent differential, I'm going to write it like this, and it's going to be the standard stereo differential, but then I, this is a contraction. Uh, if it is, okay, let me, let me now remind you what this is. So these, these 10, it takes an M form and it sends it to M plus one. Um, IV, the contraction, it sends an M form to an M minus one. Okay, and I guess uh, that's more or less what we need to do. If you forgot, let me remind you, if I have some form alpha, which is one over k factorial, alpha mu one, mu k, dx one, which dxk, then IV of alpha is going to be essentially one over k minus one factorial, v mu one, then I have alpha mu one, you see it's contraction, then mu two, mu k, dx mu two, which dx mu k. Okay. So now I'm very close, I have my differential, I now need to show you, uh, remember this part is about defining the equivalent cohomology, I define the equivalent differential. Uh, you more or less know where I'm going, so equivalent differential, if I have a, with, with one condition of new potency, I can show you, I can now define cohomology, so let's do that. It's clear? Any questions so far? Let me. Okay, so, so dv squared is essentially, okay, I wrote it. This square is going to be d square minus d i v minus i v d uh, plus i v square, okay? So this is zero, sort of from kindergarten. This might not be obvious, but it, it acts on, on anti-symmetric tensors, right? So if I, this is going to be symmetric, if I, if I do mu one, mu two, and it's acting on anti-symmetric, so it gives me zero as well. So this is also zero. And this, if you remember your differential geometry, this is, I let somebody from, of the students to tell me what is the answer here? Lead derivative, right? So minus lead derivative. Um, and that's essentially, now we are in business because it tells me on, on the space of V equivariant forms or polyforms, lambda V M, so this is the space of polyforms, oh, I keep mi mi mixing my notation, sorry. Um, such that the, the lead derivative factoring on them is zero. On that space, I do have new potency, so I'm ready to define my cohomology, and I'm going to write it uh, quickly right here. So the N equivalent cohomology of my space M is going to be kernel of my operator, my equivalent stereo differential. This, let me remind you that this acts uh, I can write it like this, on M modulo, oops, the image of that operator, which acts, of course, on V M minus one. So that's my definition. Okay, so, so now we introduce a little bit of machinery, but uh, again, our ultimate goal was integrals, right? So I have to get back to integrals, but of course integrals, I, I'm going to relate integrals to cohomology classes very quickly. So that's, that's what I want to do. Uh, next, so let's do that. So remark. So if a polyform alpha of highest degree, highest differential degree, and 
is equivariantly closed, then alpha n, n again is, remember I did my decomposition, sorry that I erased it, but n is sort of the top degree form, then alpha n and alpha n minus one are closed forms. Oops. Okay, so let's check that, that is, uh, that is immediate. And again, many of the statements here are, are proven uh, very easily. So uh, this is my statement. Some form is equivariantly close. Of highest, highest differential degree. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So again, remember my polyform is a, is a form of sum of, of degree n uh, from n to zero to, to the top, to L. Um, okay, so here's my condition, and I want to now prove that the, these two, let's say top n degree and n minus one degree are also close. So the proof again is, ob is, is immediate because all I need to do is to write this on the node. So remember the definition of the equivalent differential was d minus iv. So what I need to do is to say, okay, I will have d alpha n plus d alpha n minus one plus d alpha blah, 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 et cetera, right? And then I have minus iv acting on alpha n, minus iv acting on alpha n minus one, et cetera. Yes, I wrote it. Now, I'm saying that this is zero. And now look at the degree of this form. This form has degree m, m plus one, right? There is nothing else in this sum that can have that degree because this will have degree n, and this one will have degree a minus one. So this has to be zero by itself. So that's my statement. Dn, d alpha n is closed, okay? The top degree form of an equivariantly closed form is closed. And similarly, you can, you can chase that basically this is degree n, the, the next one will be a minus one, this is a minus one, so this also has to be closed. There is no other form of degree n that can contribute to this being zero. So this is also zero, that's my statement. Okay, so, uh, and similarly, but I will, not, I will not even write it, similarly I can show that if, if some polyform beta of highest, of highest degree n is equivalently exact, then beta n and beta n minus one have to be equivalent, it have to be exact in, this, in, the, in the normal sense. Okay, so now, uh, bear with me for a minute because again, our goal was to go to integrals and I have uh, diverged a little bit, but now we are very close because why? Why we're very close because I have now this statement. Uh, it's very similar to, to what you do in, in ordinary cohomology. So let's say uh, ordinary, I mean the RAM. So, so let's, let's see why this statement is, is powerful for us. Because one more definition, definition. The integral over the manifold M of a polyform alpha is by definition equals to the integral of everything else is zero. That's definition, okay? And you see now I'm, I'm talking, now I'm connecting. So what, what happens now is that I can do this. So I can integrate some form and that in, so in ordinary, the rank cohomology this define, this is defined up to uh, a cohomology class, right? So I'm going to, so let me do it like this, so I can add an equivalently exact piece, and um, I might, my, so my, my, my statement is that cohomology classes, right? So the, this integral is independent of the cohomology class that I, the representative that I use. And then this is very easy because my second statement is the, in, the, the, the integral of an exact form means that the top form is exact, right? So maybe I write one, one formula. So the contribution from here would be something like this. B will have the top degree. But now I use stocks. And this tells me that if my space is compact, this is crucial. Question? Oh, okay. Sorry, 
I take it as a definition because you can, you can try to define intersection, you can try to define more, more complicated. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can, but, okay, but you have to, you have to say what the, what the, what the integral means for the equivalent form. Oh, oh, that's what you, oh, yeah. sorry, okay, thanks. Sorry. Okay, so here I use the stocks and now if my, if my, if my boundary was empty, this would be zero. Okay, so essentially, and now we are, we are closer to what we want. So now we know that I can pick any representative in the same cohomology class, equivalent cohomology class, and the integral will not change. So now you should be, uh, you should now realize that we are closer to one of the main arguments of localization. Uh, and I guess that's what I'm going to talk about now. So now I want to, my main, my next, 10 minutes is to prove that equivalent integrals localize. Let me, let me have that slogan. So let's see that. So uh, again, remember your, your, your original, uh, the original example. Uh, so in that original example, the answer came from the fixed point of the, of the U1 action, okay? So my statement more generally is that the, which I want to prove right now, is that the integrals, oops, localize to the following locus. So the set of points that belong to M on which have to use a little bit of notation, sorry. The norm, I'm still talking about abelian, right? So I, I introduce a vector on points on which the norm of the vector is zero. So that's the main statement that I want to prove. Um, I'm pretty close. So of course, one possibility, so let me, let me do, I'm going to, to now do two ways. One way is, of course, uh, slick, but not very obvious or not very, uh, so one, one way is, is, is of course, um, easy to show, but this is not what we do in localization. So I also want to emphasize the connection with supersymmetric localization. So one way is, of course, to construct uh, a form, oops, no T here, no I here, sorry. So if I construct this form, uh, Okay, my claim is that this form is in the same cohomology class as alpha. And this you can see more or less by saying this formal uh, exponential is T dv of beta plus dot, 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 um, which is alpha plus alpha, well, let me have this T here, dv of beta plus dot, 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 but alpha is closed, so I can put alpha inside. And similarly in other terms, so, so these two forms, alpha T and alpha, differ by some exact form. Complicated, but exact form. So they are in the same cohomology, and therefore the integral is independent of t. So that's argument number one, which is, again, it was, it was very obvious. But I want to propose uh, the argument that nicely connects with what we do in localization, so let's, let's, let me remind you or, or introduce. So the integral is independent of t, so then I, therefore, I haven't proven that it localizes yet, but therefore I can take, I can take uh, t equals zero, t equals infinity, and compute this. This is, this is just that, that statement, for computing the integral. Sorry? What is beta, is it a function? Beta is some polyform, some, some polyform. Alpha two? So alpha There's no alpha two, I'm sorry, it's alpha t. So I'm defining a deformation of alpha, Alpha is a polyform too, yes. Everything is polyform. They are all equivalent polyforms. Sorry? They are all equivalent polyforms. Yes, 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 yes. And this alpha is equivalently close, of course. That's what I can put it in here. Ah. Alpha is equivalently close because it defines a cohomology, right? So I need, I need equivalently close. Okay, so good. So, but this, this argument, again, this argument is, uh, is not my favorite argument. The favorite argument, of course, is to define some z that depends on t, which is going to be. Maybe should we use some lambda? Okay, you use t of the f. 
Uh -huh. No, T is still there's some parameter, this some real parameter. Is So, so now, they, they of course, the best object for, for us to define, and this is what this is what connects nicely with localization, is to let me compute this integral. So now you can forget about argument one. Now this is this is your argument. I want to I wanted to compute this integral. I know that at t equals zero, this is the integral that I'm interested. But in, now I deform it, and of course, a way to see how it depends on t is by differentiating with respect to t. Uh, by differ differentiating with respect to D, what I would get is alpha is here, uh, dV of beta is going to be here, and I still have T dV of beta, okay? And now um, I can do integration by parts, so this is dV of the whole thing, and then sign that I will not be very precise, so I write there's a sign here that I have to be more careful, uh, but then I'll have, oops, beta is out, dV of alpha e to the t dV of beta. Alpha is closed, it defines a cohomology class for us. Uh, so essentially this dV can act on the exponential. And what I would get is essentially, I guess, let me not, not worry about signs, m beta alpha dV square of beta e to the t dV of beta. But dv squared, we already showed that it was the lead derivative from beta, and because e beta is b equivalent, this is zero. So that integral is independent of t. That's another, that's, this is the more direct, the more, um, the definition aligned with, uh, with what we do in, in localization, okay? So now, because it's independent of t, I can compute it for t equals zero, which is what I want, or for t goes to infinity. I still have to show that it localizes. I haven't, I, I, I'm just, so far, I have just shown you that it is independent of t. Now, let me, let me kill the argument or finish the argument with showing that it does localize. So it, it lives only in a, in a very specific neighborhood, the one that I, that I claim. Questions? Okay, so let, let, me, let me show you again now that it localizes. So I have shown you that it's independent of t, but I haven't shown you that it, that it leaves completely determined in this neighborhood. That's what I need to show you now, okay? So let's do that. Let's do that. So, so what, what I need to do is to construct, so let me say differently, construct your dv of beta explicitly. So because I have a vector, so I have a manifold with metric. I said I, I want to assume everything that I want. Uh, then I, at the end I will tell you how things are, are relaxed. So because, um, because I, have a, I have a manifold with metric, I also have a vector. So of course I can use the metric to construct the dual form, natural dual form. So my dual form, I'm going to construct it as G, B, a little bit formal, but of course, what this means in coordinates is that I, I do this. Okay? This is. Sorry, the, yes? I mean, this uh, modulus of t equals, equal to zero, what, what do you see here? Not I, will, I will show it to you now. No, not, not yet. I, I want to show you now that not only localize it, but it localizes precisely on that locus. So then you are assuming beta to be invariant under this? Of course, of course. Okay, so I have a natural one form. This is the one form that I'm going to use. Um, so IV of eta, let me wake up again the students. What is IV of beta? Of eta, sorry. B squared, the norm, exactly, right? You can see it here. The, the contraction substitutes that by B, so I get B. What did I write here? V square, or the norm of V. So now, uh, now we go back to, to our expression, to our Z of T, if you wish. And we had, um, so I want to inter in compute this. I can compute it for whatever T I like. So let me take T goes to infinity. And now my integral over the whole manifold of alpha e to the T d eta. The eta is non-zero. But then I have, let me write it 
ostensibly like this, maybe without double domain. But okay, so now when t goes to infinity, the only part, this is kind of like a delta function, right? So it's a Gaussian. So the only contribution can come from points where v is non-zero, well, sorry, when v is zero. So this proves that abelian equivalent uh, integrals localized on the locus where the, the vector has zero points or, z or zero norm, which is precisely, again, in the case, I don't have time to do explicitly, to go back to do explicitly the sample, but in that example, you see that the norm is sine square of theta. So when, when, when theta, when zero and pi is essentially when the norm is zero, so now we understand why that example w had to work. Okay. Okay. Yes, z of t is independent of t. Let me compute it when t goes to infinity. Yeah. So beta is eta, of course. Uh, because I took a specific eta in this case, right? Right. So let me let me sorry let me let me maybe I, I one formula there. So d eta minus i v of eta. But i v of eta, I, the smart students in the back told me it was exactly the norm. So I, I, I see that this integral can only get contribution when b is zero, v is zero. Okay? So that essentially, that essentially finishes this part. So equivariant integrals, of course, I, there are many more, more things to do. I did the abelian case. I can go to non-abelian. I will tell you at the end, um, I will tell you at the end, uh, the full strength of this, but that have shown to you that equivariant integrals uh, localize in the, in the, to the locus where the norm of the, of the, of the U1 action uh, vanishes. So in which part do you use the fact that the group is abelian? Because I'm using only one vector, right? If I had, right, I use only one vector here, otherwise I have to consider extending this space and, uh, and then the lead derivative will, will have anti commutator I can I can do it, but but I'm just one vector w in in my space, and this is my answer. Of course, if I have many vectors, what's going to happen is that it will localize to the to the intersection of all the points where where the where the norm vanishes. Now, uh, the the master formula, or the the big theorem in in this uh, in all this story, uh, is Atiyah Bot, and uh, then I have to confess my my cultural ignorance. Uh, so there is a Berlin and um, Bernier. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but essentially what I want to show you now is that theorem. Okay, so, so let me write the names first so that I, I don't have to, to worry much about it. So, Atiyah, Bot. Okay, so Berlin, uh, Verge, I guess. So this, this is, okay, this is 84, this is a little later, this is 82. There's another famous theorem that I will talk about at the end, if I have time, which is Duster Mac Heckman. And uh, this is also 82, at least it was published in 82. So the story is essentially that this guy is founded in a very specific context, localization for, for some Hamiltonian actions. Um, this guy found it in a more general context, and of course, this, the super generalization is at the above. Then, I. G N E. Okay, sorry. Thank you for the French, uh, French-speaking colleagues here. Okay. Good. So now let's let's try to prove this 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 theorem. Uh, we almost we almost have all the all the ingredients, so. It should be easy as soon as I find another piece of chalk. Um, all right. <clears throat> so, so again, the theorem you can say is, is going to be a explicit formula for the integral of uh, of equivalently of, of equivalent forms. Okay. So, so, so let's assume just to make uh, things simpler. Assume the localization locus of, of 
the killing vector B is, is MV, which is essentially a set of points. And I'm going to assume that, of course, the points are isolated. I'm going for the easy case. The points are isolated. So let me, oops, isolated points. Okay. So if I have, I have some manifold and I'm interested in one point that is separate from other complicated points, of course, I go to, I use coordinates that are appropriate to that point, right? So I go locally now to that point. And close to, in the neighborhood of that point, of course, my metric is going to be flat. That's what a manifold means, right? So from I, from one to L, this is 2L dimensional, dxi squared plus dy i squared. And I'm also going to write it in polar coordinates because it makes some computation more obvious, dr i squared plus r squared i. Again, i is like, you see I have some um, decomposition in planes. But okay, so now um, what is my vector in this, in this particular coordinate? My vector is going to be, again, in that neighborhood, it's, I have some weights, y i d d x i plus x i d d y i, which I of course can also write from L one to i one to L of omega p d d phi i. Okay, so you can see that this is more or less the exercise that we did before. Um, so the circle action, um, so the circle action, I, I just split it into planes. I'm going to write it like this, where this R is going to be what you spec cosine pi, sine omega pi, minus sine omega pi, and cosine omega pi. So wait, let, let, me, let, me, let me tell you where, where I am. Uh, this is a phi here, sorry. Phi I. So let me let me let me tell you where I am. I'm going to I'm making my computation in a very clean uh, coordinate system that is particular to that point. Okay, but as we always do in differential geometry, you go to some nice coordinates, you do that computation, and then if you recognize that your answer is tensorially, then you're done. Then this is true for any coordinate. And, and I have lost nothing, right? So let me, let me that's, that's where we are. So that's what I have. The action of the generator of, of that vector, it, it would act on each sub subspace. It acts with this, with this rotation. And I have my vector. Of course, when I have my vector, I automatically have my one form, which I already use for localization. My one form is going to roughly be some from I1 to L omega pi, and this time I'm going to just write in, in polar because uh, lack of time. Oops, no, it's just this one form, sum of this one form. And of course now let's see. So the only computation that we need to do, because we know that we localize with this eta, so let me write for you, let me write what I have already done so I can be very quick. So dv of eta is going to be twice the sum from i from one, omega p i dx i wedge d y i. Uh, sorry that I, I keep mixing. Okay, it no, doesn't matter. Omega p i square x i square plus y i square. Okay, so remember this is a contraction. Contraction means wherever I see this, I substitute by, um, sorry. In my form, whenever I see this, I substitute by, by the appropriate um, coefficient. So that's what, I, that's what I have. So this is my one form. And now, remember my Z, oh, shoot. My Z that I wanted to compute is essentially uh, of T was the limit as T went to infinity, integral omen n of alpha e to the T dv n. Okay, so T is a large parameter here. I'm computing in that, in that limit. 
So here's the only, the only non-trivial uh, step here. When I take t to infinity, so this, is, this I have to expand, right? And I, I expand uh, formally, one plus this plus a half, this is squared, et cetera. But you see, I'm looking for the term that, that contributes the most when t goes to infinity. So that would be the term with the most t, obviously. And I can have my, 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 my space is two dimensional, so I can have at most, this is a two form, the n of e that is a two form, so I, I can have lt. So that's the only term that I worry about. All the other terms are still leading in t. And that's the, the, that's the gist of this computation. That I now, you see, because I constructed my dual form strictly from this, from this field. So from alpha, what can alpha be? What can alpha give me? It cannot give me any form because it will be then lower degree in L. So the only alpha that can contribute has to be, uh, so I'm, I'm going from t go, goes to infinity, of alpha zero. This, the, for, the, the, only, the only thing that I can take from alpha is, 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 is function, the function that was there. So alpha zero at my point P, and the integrals that I have to compute are going to be from one to L of T omega P I, integral from zero to two pi of D phi I. And then I have integral from zero to infinity of D R square e to the, e to the minus T omega P I square r i square, okay? That's my integral. And this is, again, this is a simple integral, just exponential. But the beauty here is that you see that t will cancel. And the answer is essentially, so I'm going to already write the full answer because uh, we have uh, limited time. The integral over this locus of alpha e to the t dv eta is essentially alpha zero on p, two pi to the l, two pi comes from this integral, I have it l times, two pi to the l divided by product from i one to the l omega p i. That's the integral in the large, in the t goes to infinity, but again, it's independent of t. So now this is the product that I was, uh, I was talking about. I use a very specific representation of the action of, of my killing vectors, uh, but I got the product of the eigenvalues. So that of course, uh, that of course um, uh, smells like a determinant. The actual formula I will write in a, in a second, but let me make, um, let me make the, the two comments. So this is still not the, I mean, this is already, maybe I'll, let me just write the formula covariantly. Let me write the formula covariantly. This is the main result of equivariant cohomology. So the integral of alpha was two pi to the L sum over the fixed points uh, of alpha zero evaluated at those fixed points divided by the Fafian of the action of the vector field at that point, okay? So this is the main localization, uh, localization formula. This is again due to all the people that I have already mentioned. Um, Uh, the formula, indeed, indeed, the formula is more general. Uh, I assume it just to be to be to be quick, uh, to be able to compute. I can, I, yeah, I agree with you. I can use, uh, I can use, uh, I can find the dual without without necessarily doing that. But this is the this is the main localization formula. Again, it gives you some integral of this polyform exactly at the fixed point of this of this metric. So our construction also shows you. Uh, that the only points that can contribute, um, the only points that, well, okay. so it, it also tells you uh, precisely that the width of this Gaussian is precisely proportional to D, so you can take it, um, take it very small. So I have five minutes. In the last five minutes, uh, I will make one comment about Dusterman-Heckman that came before 
of this uh, story. But this tech man um, is, a, is a very specific case. So, so in that case, you have a 2L symplectic manifold. Yes. V is the vector, is my vector. Yes. So L is the, is the action of the vector. I wrote R, but I want to write it infinitesimally. So this is the, the okay. Okay. okay, so so what happens there? Again, there are many, many examples in this class that you know and love, classical phase space, uh, maybe Kalao Yao, cotangent bundle. So there are many examples that fall in this category, but the key thing for us is that you have a symplectic form. This form, by definition, is closed, okay? And, uh, and also, if you have a Hamiltonian action, so some people might recognize this Hamiltonian action also as, as moment map, but essentially what happens is that Hamiltonian action generated by, again, some vector v, um, so this quantity, the contraction of the of the symplectic form with this vector is D of a function. In this case, this function is the Hamiltonian function or moment map. But you see, I, if I rewrite, okay, I didn't do it slick enough, but I can write this, uh, oops, I can write, I can write it like this. And another way of saying this is that the, the equivalent differential of H plus omega is zero. So contraction of a function is zero, d of h is this, right? And when this act, uh, d of, so the round differential on omega is zero, and the, and the contraction is this. So this condition tells me that I can now localize using this form. And this is the formula that Dusterman Heckman wrote. So let me, okay, I will not write the formula because it's essentially the same formula that I wrote before. Um, but, uh, okay, so, So I have five minutes, so let me let me kill the the original example with this gun that we now have. So the metric I already wrote, the vector was D defined. Again, back to example. Back to the example. So now we can see why we were lucky that we choose, chose cosine. If we had chosen some other function, then, then we would be in trouble. Uh, so in that case, and I'm also going to write it in the, context, in the language of, well, okay, this, this is now a question of language. But um, so my Hamiltonian, which is also sometimes called in, in the literature the height function, uh, it's kind of a Morse function as well, was cosine of theta. Um, IV of omega in that case, well, omega, what is the symplectic form on, on the two sphere? Is sine of theta, let me write it carefully, d theta d phi, which I'm going to write as d phi wedge d cosine of theta, okay? Uh, so this object is going to be, what is it? So here it is, so I, whatever I see differential, I substitute by v, so essentially this is going to be d cosine of theta which is precisely H, okay? So that, oh, okay, I have to talk, talk a little bit more, more. So the Fafian of the action of that vector in the North Pole, one of the fixed points, is plus one, and the Fafian of the action of the vector in the South Pole is minus one. And these are the two fixed points that we wrote in, in our original example. So this is roughly the story of equivariant localization. This is the, the main theorem is, is here. Uh, it tells you when Integrals, yes. Sorry? Yeah, I guess. So your H was really a T times. T times, okay. Okay, um, okay so, so essentially this is, this is the story. It's, a, it's, as I said, it's an appetizer. It's an introduction to the introduction to localization. It's a very clean example. Uh, my hope is that it inspires you to see the roots of localization. You see here there was no, there were no fermions. It was some, it was a, it's all a structure that is, that is behind. But the answer is that the exact integral 
uh, is not approximated. This is the exact answer. So I also, for, for those who want to, to pursue this story a little further, so I'll, I'll tell you what, what I did not say. So most of my discussion was, of course, about the, the integral with the whole space. But my, my, well, what I claimed that I was going to talk about was equivalent cohomology. So I need to, to tell you about all cohomology classes. Yes. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so I want to mention that the proper definition that I only talk about the top cohomology class, the proper definition of this subject is something that is, of course, uh, dealt with in algebraic topology. So you need to find some contractible space on which the group acts without fixed point. All our problem came from fixed points. So if I construct a space on which uh, the group acts without fixed points, and then I multiply that by my original space. I take the question. Let me write the formula because uh, so the formula, which requires a little bit of algebraic topology, is this. So I take some generalization, some space on which the group acts freely. I multiply. Now, if I divide, this is going to act freely, and this this defines my cohomology, my equivalent cohomology without a problem. Uh, then, of course, it's, it's subtle, right? So that's what I. So this is my fourth reference, Matvei Libin. So he will do this very carefully if you are interested. You have to also prove that it's independent of this extension. It's sort of, but, but all, all, all the ingredients are there. Uh, you can, of course, I, I didn't do it here, but in the book of Sabo and also in Matvei Levin, you can, discuss, you can see more, more general, uh, like top class or chain class. All this is, is defined in, in this context. Um, the non-abelian generalization is also there. Uh, that somebody asked me, uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not very complicated. Um, so I want to finish, again, saying that this is sort of like a very, very simple skeleton, but very rigorous. And I invite you to, as you listen to the introduction to localizations uh, lecture, find the analog, the analogs. Find in that context what is the V, what is, the, what is this integral that you're trying to compute, Etc. And make make that uh, part of your homework. So thank you very much. <laughs>